So as we get started, I just wanted to check in. How are you all today? I'm hearing some alhamdulillahs, I'm hearing some good. Um, you know, one of the things that I think helps us connect to any talk or any sort of um, presentation is understanding why am I here today? What's my intention? And it's always important to remember um, our intention is what determines the outcome of any sort of action, right? And Allah's mercy is with us, um, and His um, His rahma it encompasses us. And with any good intention that we have, that can be a source of reward. So you just sitting here today on a rainy Saturday afternoon, this can be a source of blessing and rahma for you, inshallah. So. You know, I just want to start off with the fact that there's something really beautiful and pure about waiting for Ramadan. There's something very sincere about all of us striving in any way we can to connect with Allah in Ramadan. We all are coming from diverse backgrounds. We may be a student, we may be a professional, we may be a parent, um, we may be struggling in different ways. And to be in this state of longing for Allah it is one of the most beautiful times um, of the year to be waiting for that. So I thank you for being here. And today, I want you to start off, and I will start too, with setting an intention for what do you want to get out of today? And what do you want to get out of Ramadan? A lot of us, we go into Ramadan thinking, okay, I need to check off all of these things in my checklist. I'm going to do all of these prayers and adhkar. I'm going to, you know, donate this much, right? We have this list and come towards the month of Ramadan with a very structured approach, which I'm not saying is um, wrong by any means. I think today my hope is to instill, like, what is the spirit of Ramadan as well? And how can we each take it um, in terms of a very personalized approach for where we are at with our mental health, with our capabilities right now, with our schedules, because we all have different schedules and needs. So ask yourself today, what is one thing you'd like to take away from this workshop? Maybe think about it. And I also invite discussion during this workshop, and I hope you'll share if you feel comfortable. So can anyone raise their hand and share what's one thing you would like to take away today? Or why did you decide to come today? And I know I can share a little. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. That's a beautiful summary, soul searching. I think when you get to know more about your faith, you get to know more about yourself. And I think it's a bi-directional relationship. The more you learn about Islam, you also learn more about yourself. And, you know, how am I doing? How are, um, you know, these habits going? How am I able to do more? Um, and that sort of thing. And you're right, the nafs is a very, very big um, topic in Ramadan, right? How do we uh, learn about our nafs and then control our nafs more in Ramadan? Yeah, yes. Jazakallah khair, and thank you so much for your honesty there. Like so many of us, we jump into Ramadan without the proper preparation. We don't, um, for example, know, hey, how am I going to adjust to waking up this early and then doing all of these things throughout the day? Um, and there's a spiritual component of how am I doing with my connection with Allah? Sometimes we also have judgments about where we might be at, and some of us may feel that Ramadan... Uh, pre-Ramadan anxiety, like, oh my gosh, I have all this stuff to do, am I ready for it? Um, or we may come into Ramadan with a sense of guilt or shame. Um, maybe we're not exactly where we want to be spiritually. And then those emotional aspects of our um, psyche, right, which we all have, they may interfere with our process of connecting with Allah in Ramadan. So I'm hoping today to just bring awareness to some of those topics so that we can maximize our Ramadan and our worship, inshallah. So thank you all for being here, and hope we get some participation from brothers down the road too today. So the outline for today, um, it's a bit ambitious, but we'll try to get through it um, with quality, not going through it um, quickly. I'm hoping it'll be, um, you know, substantive. So the first is taking care of our mental health without burning out. A lot of us go into Ramadan, a few days into it, we're already tired. So natural. It's a tiring experience. Uh, I think that's part of the ibadah too. Waking up early, um, going to sleep late. Um, we're really maximizing our potential every single day with the output we're doing, but then how do we sustain that with a sense of um, connection with Allah and not 
being too hard on ourselves either. So that's the first um, topic. The second is using psychological tools that we have through the science of psychology, um, through also what we know from Islam to maximize our Ramadan experience. And like I said, I want this to be a discussion. I want to hear your questions, inshallah. So please, you know, engage, ask questions, um, and I'll leave some time in some of the slides to pause and reflect. So if you have a notebook, you have paper, please feel free to jot down a few notes for yourself. For example, I'll ask you, hey, what's one of your intentions for Ramadan this year? Or what is a judgment you might have about yourself as you go into Ramadan so that you can be aware of it and kind of work on that, inshallah, so that when Ramadan arrives, we are a bit more ready to um, be a part of the um, beautiful experience of Ramadan. I want to give a disclaimer. This workshop cannot um, be a replacement for treatment, um, support that you may need for mental health challenges, or for your specific circumstance. So I want to clarify that um, that would require more one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with a medical professional or a psychologist, a therapist. Um, and also, um, I'm not a religious scholar, so there may be questions you have that would be better suited to ask a religious scholar or an imam, inshallah. So with that said, let's get started with how to take care of our mental health in Ramadan. First of all, mental health. We hear it, I think, all the time now, a lot more than probably a decade ago. And let's just connect about what is mental health. So mental health is a state of well-being. We're really trying to maximize and optimize how we feel, how we are on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of our ability to cope with stressors in our daily life, um, our ability to be productive and fruitful in whatever we would like to do in our lives, and make a contribution to our community. Um, and in terms of Islam, we have a very rich legacy of mental health and wellness, which I'll get into. Um, one of the things to know before we get into our legacy is that Muslims are not immune to mental health challenges. We currently are in a post-COVID world where we've experienced global trauma, we've experienced isolation, you know, children and teens have gotten out of their school environments and now they're reintegrating. A lot of you may be going into work and you're still figuring out how many days do I go into work? How do I connect with my coworkers? Um, how do I build social connections? One of the reasons I'm so happy to see you all here is because face-to-face -face connection is something we were missing. So a lot of factors combined have really impacted our mental health as a community and individually. One in five adults in the U.S. will experience a mental health challenge in their life at some point. This could be anxiety, depression, trauma, um, adjustment challenges, uh, relationship problems. So none of us are immune to that. And it's about how do we take a proactive approach so that we are ready when that will possibly come to us in our life. And stress is a part of the human experience. So how can we be ready for that with coping strategies, inshallah? One thing I also want to highlight, this is um, a very eye-opening uh, research piece by Dr. Rania Awad. Um, so she and her colleagues found that Muslims were twice as likely as people of other faith traditions to make a lifetime suicide attempt. So let's just sit with that statistic for a moment. I mean, to me, it, it really just highlights we need so much more in terms of awareness, access to services. We as a community are facing a lot. So we need to um, be humble and also uh, kind to ourselves when we are seeking help, inshallah. Um, one of the reasons, um, you know, the authors posited that maybe there were higher attempts um, of suicide as religious discrimination at that systematic level, but then also the stigma related, mental, related to mental health. So, which is why I'm so happy you all are here and that we have programs now within Maristan, our organization. Um, please check out our table back there. And other organizations too here, such as Khalil Center. Um, we just have a lot more access now. And I hope it will be um, easier for everyone to seek those services. There are effective treatments for mental health, including therapy, medication, lifestyle and behavior changes. Um, like I said, we have a growing number of Muslim mental health professionals. As we sit here, there is a very large Muslim mental health conference happening in Michigan. And a bunch of pioneers of this field are over there presenting on their research. 
they are remembering um, a long time ago when there are just a few mental health professionals who are Muslim, and now, mashallah, we have so many more. So um, we are in a space of more resources, and then how do we internalize those resources, right? How do we personally access those? And that's kind of what I hope to shed light on today. To keep in mind about Islam and mental health, you know, therapy can incorporate Islamic principles. Therapy um, can be what you therapy can be what you would like for it to be. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Can you all hear me? I think the larger mic just shut off, and I didn't have the small one on. So. Okay, so therapy can be what you would like for it to be. If you would like for it to incorporate Islamic principles, you can ask for that in your therapist. And if you would prefer to work with even a non-Muslim therapist, a lot of um, Muslims actually would prefer that, and it's totally up to you. Um, but just know that there are many resources out there for what you're seeking. Now, how to understand Islam and mental health one is to remember we'll all be tested in this life, no matter what. And that is just one of the elements of being a human being in this dunya. Allah um, says in the Quran, he's created death and life so that he may test you which of you is best indeed. And he is the almighty, the all forgiving. And then as Muslims, we are encouraged to seek help and treatment. So we have a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, Allah sent down the disease and the cure. And for every disease, he made a cure. Similarly, there's no disease that Allah has created except that he has also created its treatment. So whether that's medical, whether that's um, you know spiritual, whether that's psychological, it's all connected. So um, one thing I um, appreciated learning about was that Aisha radiallahu anha, who was very knowledgeable in many fields, medicine, uh, Islamic jurisprudence, a lot of other fields, she used to make a dish called talbina, which um, the Prophet ﷺ said that would um, relieve some people of their sadness. So if you think about it, how revolutionary is that concept? 1400 years ago, the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged that we have psychological and medical conditions for which we can take medication or some sort of physical um, you know, substance in order to help us. 